Rachel Bross again. Welcome to my channel, which now, as you notice, has a name, Make a Writer's Day. And today we'll be discussing about three different topics before we get to my book reviews. Now, uh, one thing that I wanted to mention first, I just got this handy dandy Trapper Keeper. And it has everything that I would ever need to keep my writing on schedule. And yes, I do get teased a lot about this since I've gotten it and called many a name. That's okay though. So, one really good reason why Trapper Keepers are your friend is that at least this one comes with filing sections. As you saw, it comes with a pencil case, a zipper pocket for any of my pens and pencils. Then it's got the nice big three inch ring binder section for all the paper that I want. And I have um, recently gotten rid of the copies that I made of my novel, but I will print them off, put them in this thing, and then be editing them soon once I get the last chapter written. So, after that being said, topic number two is a did you know topic. And I've noticed that a lot of fantasy novels like to have hunting and such within them. And uh, I'm not entirely sure as to which have depicted the protagonist actually skinning or, um, I don't really want to say butchering, but basically that, uh, the animal that they've hunted. So in my novel, I have depicted my female protagonist doing this as a means to prove to her father that she's capable of fighting because she wants to learn how to use a sword. She's already learned how to use a bow and her father believes that that's pretty much enough, letting her wear pants and hunting and using a bow. It, she doesn't need any more manly qualities. Of course, this novel is set back when women were seen to be in the kitchens and everything else. However, a lot of them do have independence. Um, so it depicts her skinning a deer. And when you skin a deer, I've watched my dad do this a lot. I've seen my dad's friends do this a lot. Um, what you want to do would be best is to find a, what I call a deer hanger or a carcass hanger, which actually looks like a triangle and it's got two hooks on the end. And you take the uh, sinewy sections of the deer's hind ankles. If you look at a deer, they got that little indentation, the concave area uh, in their back ankles. And you hoist it up and you lunge those over on those little hooks there and the deer hangs upside down. So after that, you'll want to take a very sharp knife, cut circles around the ankles at the top, cut circles around the, the front ankles towards the bottom. Then you slice the skin down the legs till they meet to the stomach all the way down and do the same as you get to the front legs. It almost makes a really wonky kind of X. So once that's done, once that's done, you open the skin up to the stomach area gently. I cannot stress this enough to you. Gently cut the gut open. Do not hit the stomach. My dad demonstrated to me when I was younger why you don't want to hit the stomach. The smell is absolutely atrocious. Oh, it's awful. If this is a male deer, you'll also want to cut off the testicles. Not to be too frank, but yes. So once you have officially gutted the animal, taken all the organs out and everything like that, you'll want to gently, so that you don't pull the deer from the hooks, but at the same time firmly enough to detach the, um, the tendons from the skin. And it's gonna make this nice little crispy crackly pop as they pull down. So you pull it down with as much force as you can muster all the way down to the neck where my dad, being the awesome um, countryman that he is, he took limb lobbers and would 
cut the neck bone, sever the vertebrae. And if you're not careful, he has done this once. He's gotten sprayed by the arteries in the neck and probably the jugular vein as well. Um, it's not pretty. <laughs> it's not fun. But it's effective in getting that head off so that you can get the rest of the skin off. And then once you're done with that, that's when the fun part of sectioning the meat comes, which I have not been privy to see yet. Um, so that's basically how you skin a deer. And I was wondering how many of you out there have that in your fantasies or any of your other maybe science fiction, post-apocalyptic zombies, anything like that, where your people are trying to survive while foraging and hunting and whether or not you've actually depicted them skinning something. So the idea behind skinning the deer actually plays a role in most other animals too. It's just how big the animal is and whether or not you can hoist it up, how much it weighs, stuff like that. Uh, she also, in my novel, my protagonist, uh, being that the male protagonist is injured, she takes it upon herself to skin a bear uh, about 10 feet tall at the shortest, I believe it is. And it takes a lot for them to hang that bear up across a tree. And it takes hours, several hours for her to get all the skin off because of course bears are massive. They got a lot of fur and a lot of skin and a lot of, uh, basically a lot, a lot of mass to cover, obviously. So, um, hogs, I've, I've seen my dad hunt hogs before. I have yet to see him uh, skin them, but the gutting of them is basically the same. Um, I've seen many a hollowed out hog. I know I sound so country right now. It's okay. <laughs> um, but basically that, that is it. Now, I was wanting to know if any of y'all needed that in, in uh, any of your writings. Something that makes it more down to earth, I guess you could say, more realistic maybe. It all depends on your world. Now, you could apply this knowledge to aliens, obviously. You could apply this knowledge to, say, uh, the book, The um, Princess of Mars. You, they have these weird alien creatures. If they were to eat them, I mean, you could possibly apply the same skinning technique to those. Even if you have an outer space sci-fi novel, you want to do experiments. It's almost just like dissecting a frog at school. You still go through the same motions as far as slicing it open and looking at all the innards. So, moving on to topic number three, which would be writing advice. Now, my novels, I know I keep saying my novels a lot, but I'm using them as examples because that's all I've got as an example right now. I mean, I've read others, but my novels, I have been told, are a little bit problematic because a lot of readers that have given me feedback on my novels have said that they don't like the fact that I use either first person present or third person omniscient present. They prefer past tense. And see, I can't do past tense on a lot of uh, reading on my own. I will push through it if the story is good enough. But I prefer present tense because present tense draws me straight into the action. It puts my mind into the mind of that character and plays everything out the way that that character, I, as I believe, would be feeling it, hearing it, smelling it, and seeing it basically. So um, I was wondering how many of you struggle with point of view and with tensing. And I've noticed that a lot of people prefer first person to third person. Oh, and then I get some people say that they absolutely hate first person. They would much prefer third person omniscient because you get to know everything in everybody's head. But at the same time, with third person omniscient, you get the head hopping. And I try so hard not to head hop. I try to make a clean break between which person is thinking, which person is speaking, and which person is in which scene. So, with first person, you don't have to worry about head hopping, obviously, because you're only going from one point of view. However, if you do first person, or excuse me, third person limited, where you have more than one point of view, but you only see through one character at a time, you don't get to see through every single person at one time. It, it head, the head hopping is a little less, but even, even so you get some head hopping with that as well. And 
I struggled with that when I first started writing. My novel actually started out to be first person only. And um, I, as, as the story progressed into about the third part, I realized that it needed to be said from both perspectives of my main characters. So I turn it into third person omniscient. However, as the story has progressed into the second novel and into the third novel, it has grown more to be third person limited, more so than third person omniscient because I'm trying to add in some of the villains perspectives as well. And uh, I don't know how many people like that um, I don't know how many people prefer that their villain be some silent off-screen character that doesn't come in until the climax. Or if they like the bounce around from the protagonist to the antagonist and, and all that back and forth kind of thing to where you know everything that's going on. I kind of want there to be a little bit of surprise. But at the same time, some stuff doesn't make sense unless you include everything. Let's see. The final bit of my episode is going to be my reviews. Today I'm doing four reviews. Uh, these are Alethea, Goddess and Empress. I believe that's how her name is pronounced. It's either Alafia or Alethea. Um, then there is the collective short stories called Creativity Brewing. Uh, then there would be The Legend of Chip, The Legend Begins, which I just finished reading because it was a little bit lengthy compared to the other books. I read the other books first so that I could get all of them in. Uh, the last one would be Fated to Meet You. All four of these books are great. Uh, all four of these books are drastically different, obviously, because I've got a fantasy like a medieval type Game of Thrones almost fantasy. Then I've got a short story collection. Then I've got a based in Scotland, almost outlander sort of um, prequel. I'm not sure if it's a prequel or if it's basically just the book one. Um, it's got a lot of Scottish embellishments obviously because it's based there but it's also based in the um days of pirates i believe it's in the 1700s i'm not sure i'd have to go back and look um then the last one is like a fairy tale very oh it's so sweet kind of moment and um it's it's just four very different very good novels so with Alethea, the, the review that I left on there states, um, Goddess and Empress is a lovely and smartly eloquent prose set within a medieval-esque period. Uh, the story to me is a slow set and character driven paced story that has just enough elements for young and old alike to enjoy such stories. Uh, the conversation alone between the characters is so well written and thought provoking. I especially love the quote from Alethea towards the end. She's speaking as if her father is speaking aloud to her. That um, she's also speaking to a a villain. Not, I, I believe it is the main villain, but it's one of, obviously. Um, says uh, she thought you were her entertainment. Let's show her how you play with dolls. When I read that, I was like, oh, yes. Oh, this is good. So with Creativity Brewing, the one, the uh, review that I left says, this collection is a fun, family-friendly set of reads. I especially enjoyed Skeleton in the Closet. I wish that Skeleton in the Closet had continued. I actually believe that a lot of the stories in this collection should have their own little novelettes, which I put in the review. Uh, it's um, a, It could become a family favorite. It could become a child's favorite. It, one singular story within this collection could become someone's favorite. It, it's a very broad collection as well as a very well put together 
collection. Uh, then there is The Legend of Chip. And I said that this aged start to an exciting journey had me transfixed with just enough mystery to continue reading. While more suited for male readers, in my opinion, this book has adventure, action, and mystery enough for any age that they be male or female. Set in Scotland, the story has its fun with the dialect and accents as well as customs. It had me chuckling with its light musings. It transported me to life at sea for a time because at one point Chip is on a boat. Uh, a ship, actually. The Royal British Navy ship. Naval ship, excuse me. And I have to say Captain Atul is one of my favorite characters. And then later on, little bitty Humphrey becomes one of my favorite characters because he has the mind of a child and it's like Chip has to explain almost everything to him and it breaks it down and it, it gives a little bit of another side of wonder to this story. And uh, it, it's, it would be enjoyable for everyone, no matter what their age or their gender, obviously. But to me, had this been a movie, uh, it, it would be more like something my dad and I would watch. Something that is action-packed, male-driven, adventure, basically. My dad and I really enjoy movies like that. The action-packed, like uh, Transporter, um, Meg, the Lethal Weapon series, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. All of the Die Hard movie. Obviously, you, you get the picture here. But we also like stuff like Pirates of the Caribbean. This would be a perfect Pirates... Uh, Scottish version, maybe, of something similar to Pirates of the Caribbean. So, anyway, that book is awesome. I'm looking forward to reading the second book when I get time. I have to finish my list first, obviously. But, uh, moving on to Fated to Meet You. This is actually a very sweet... Uh, almost confusing at first because for one it was one of the shorter reads it was uh, a tad bit rushed in my opinion however it is a good story and it is good enough that any age would enjoy it uh, just like the previous uh, story but this one is more of like a fairy tale type thing where a girl in today's world, in 2020, uh, is transported through a portal to the 1700s roundabout into the chamber of a princess who has passed away. And the rest of the story depicts her being betrothed to a uh, prince that is fixing to be a king. Now, I'm not going to give you any more spoilers because I want y'all to read it, obviously. But it is one of those that ends on such a sweet note you can't help but say, aww. And <laughs> in my opinion, at the very least, it should be made into a Hallmark movie. Um, but those are my four reviews. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Um, I have been forgetting in the last two episodes to mention not only my novel obviously I've mentioned it in each episode so far strange glow collective uh, the second book is strange glow collective book two the full version of book two is Kindle this is part one obviously my part two is behind me but I don't need to pull that down but what I've been forgetting what I've been forgetting is that I have a 99 cent short story that's a sci-fi short that is about a Marine who was framed. I know you're thinking, wow, another military frame job, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the guy was framed for killing his whole platoon, only to wake up in the hospital with a brand new body, be arrested, and sent to prison for life. However, now there is this suppressed gene within the body that recreates you when you die. As long as your brain is intact, you are created, scrambled about your genes. You are recreated as another version of 
of your parents and their parents and so on. You could come out looking like your uncle. You could come out looking like your mom if you're a dude. I have one character that comes back looking like he, his possible sister. So, go check that out. It's 99 cents on Kindle. As I've said before, Kindle can be put on any device, be it Android or Mac, be it PC or Apple, be it the Nook even. You just download the free app. You sign in with your Amazon account. You don't have an Amazon account. That's free too. You just sign up for Amazon. Put that account into the uh, sign-in boxes and then you can buy any book you want from Kindle. Uh, also, if you haven't already, please click subscribe. Please check me out on Twitter. Um, then, let's see. Check out those books that I've reviewed, please. They are great. A lot of them already have some reviews. Some of them don't, and they need some more reviews. So, please read them and review them. So, see y'all next time, and make a writer's day.